Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started here. A very fly very quickly. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Jasper Dent, and I'm the event coordinator for McNally Robinson here in Saskatoon. I'd like to start off by acknowledging that this event is being held on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Uh, just a note that this event is being live streamed, so please be aware of the webcam to your right. It's just in the corner there. I'd also like to take this moment to encourage you to silence your phones for the duration of the event. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Saskatoon launch of Squandered, Canada's Potash Legacy by Eric Klein. Thank you to Eric for being here tonight and for working with us to create this event. Eric Klein practiced law in his hometown of Saskatoon prior to serving 16 years in the Saskatchewan legislature, where he held several, several senior cabinet positions, including health, finance, and industry and resources. After politics, he worked for 12 years as a corporate executive in the mining sector before establishing an arbitration practice and working as a professional fused glass artist. I will now turn things over to Eric. Please give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jasper, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I could I progress a bit? I, this just reminds me I, of Jasper introducing me uh, because I, I've never met him before. And uh, it reminds me of an event shortly after I was elected where the Premier was invited to uh, speak to the National Conference in Saskatoon. And the legislature was sitting, and as often happens, the Premier doesn't go, but someone is assigned to go. And uh, I was assigned to go up to Saskatoon to attend this event. And I was sitting in the audience at a table talking to the other people at the table and uh dinner was over and all of a sudden the the master ceremonies at the front said and now to introduce our guest speaker i'd like to call upon the local mla very client and they had not asked me to introduce the speaker and i didn't know anything about the speaker <laughs> so i'm walking up in front of the room and uh I'm saying to myself, well, I can't go up there and say, well, no one asked me to do this because we'd all look pretty stupid. <laughs> and uh, so I got to the front and I said, uh, I'm very pleased to be asked to introduce our guest speaker. That was actually a lie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about the accomplishments of our guest speaker uh, because they are well known to you. <laughs> and, uh, the, the list of accomplishments of the guest speaker are, is so long that if I started going into it, I would intrude upon her time. And uh, I don't want to do that because we've come to listen to her, not to listen to me. But I think we can all agree that. Uh, when we look at what she's done, she's made a real difference in the world and, uh, to many, many people. And that's why it's, we're so anxious to hear her message tonight. So please join me in welcoming the guest speaker. And then she came up and she went to the mic and she said, I have been introduced <laughs> many times in many parts of the world. And I have never been introduced as warmly and graciously. <laughs> so that convinced me that in politics, you actually didn't have to know anything to <laughs> make a speech about it. And with that caveat, I'll begin with my remarks about this book. Uh, I want to thank McNally Robinson and staff for organizing and hosting this book launch. I want to thank the University of Regina Press for also uh, 
making it possible to have nonfiction work published in Saskatchewan, which isn't an easy thing to do. And thanks to all of you for your interest in the question of whether we are maximizing benefit for Saskatchewan people from our potash legacy, a question which directly relates to the degree of equality of opportunity and quality of life for Saskatchewan people. Saskatchewan is the Saudi Arabia of potash, but more so. Saudi Arabia leverages its 16% of the world's uh, oil reserves to dominate the world oil market and to ensure revenue from oil extraction stays in Saudi Arabia. Saskatchewan has one third of world potash reserves and one half of those in the free world. That potash is owned by the people of the province. Potash companies own the infrastructure which removes potash from the ground, not the potash itself. We allow them to remove our potash and sell it in return for payment of taxes and royalties. That price can be altered by the Saskatchewan government as circumstances change and where required in the public interest. No one disagrees that potash companies are entitled to make a reasonable return on investment. Once they have made a reasonable return on investment, excess revenue from the sale of our potash should belong to the public so that the value of the potash is received by the public. When the world price of potash increases, if potash companies are already making a reasonable rate of return, 100% of the price increase should go to the public. The world price represents the value of the product and does not go up because of investment. It is simply the result of increased demand. If increased price is not collected on behalf of the public, the public is not getting true value for its resource and the company is getting a windfall it did not earn. Government is responsible to safeguard the public interest in maximizing value from the sale of our resources. So in 1974, when the world price of oil more than doubled during the so-called energy crisis at that time, oil companies in Alberta and Saskatchewan under the terms of their leases with governments in Alberta and Saskatchewan, were entitled to receive a windfall of billions of dollars in today's dollars. Progressive Conservative Premier Peter Lockheed of Alberta and New Democrat Alan Blakey of Saskatchewan both took the same approach. They retroactively amended the leases to capture the windfall for the public. They recognized the additional revenue did not result from corporate investment or risk, and the public should get value for its resources. Saudi Arabia pulled itself out of poverty by acquiring 100% of its oil extraction business. Norway owns about 70% of theirs. It has a $700 billion U.S. sovereignty fund and social programs which provide a safety net for all of its citizens. It does this with 0.5% of the world oil reserves, less than 1%. In addition to owning one third of the world's potash reserves, Saskatchewan has the highest grade potash, the cheapest to extract, and the best potash mines in the world. These mines cannot be moved anywhere. Until 2008, potash producers made a reasonable return on investment. The price of a metric ton of potash was generally below $200 and rose to $270 in 2007. Then it jumped in 2008 to $750. Gross profits, already adequate, tripled from $1.5 billion in 2007 to $4.5 billion in 2008. This was a $3 billion windfall. Prior to the 2008 increase, PCS had stated in its annual report for 2007, it was 
thriving with potash trading at $270. The companies were already doing well. What did the provincial government do to adjust taxes and royalties in this changed circumstance? Nothing. The existing system was simply left to operate and the result was that the government took an extra $1 billion and the companies got the other $2 billion. Windfall profits to the potash companies did not begin with increased world demand for Saskatchewan potash resulting from the invasion of Ukraine by Russia in 2022. The windfall has been happening for the last 15 years. Saskatchewan's public treasury is foregoing hundreds of millions of dollars and more recently, billions of dollars per year. Shareholders, almost entirely outside Saskatchewan, receive the bulk of the benefit from increased potash value. The shareholders and potash companies are not responsible for that entirely. They don't make the tax rules. They have the ear of politicians, they curry favor through advertising and sponsorships, and generally put a favorable spin on things. No one could blame them for pushing the envelope in their favor. Their job is to maximize shareholder return, not the return to Saskatchewan people. Jack Mintz, one of the world's leading resource tax economists, a conservative-minded person uh, from the University of Calgary School of Public Policy, and former NDP Member of Parliament and economist Aaron Weir, both very capable and credible voices, have been writing papers for many years, pointing out that the Saskatchewan royalty and tax system does not capture windfall profits. It was never designed to do so. There were no windfall profits to capture. In 2017, Jim Marshall of the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy, a highly qualified and credible former official in the Department of Finance, authored a study to the same effect. The Saskatchewan government itself announced in the 2015 provincial budget that a review of potash royalties and taxes would be held. That was news welcomed by Jack Mintz and the Globe and Mail's report on business as long overdue. That review never occurred. The potash companies told the government everything was fine as it is. No need for a review. And if they aren't in a position to say how exceedingly fine the royalty and taxation system in Saskatchewan is working for them, I don't know who it is. <laughs> this book we are launching presents the numbers in a way which I think allows the reader to reach their own conclusion as to whether there's an appropriate balance between corporate profit and public good. In each of the years 2021 and 2022, the potash companies produced about the same amount of potash, around 14.3 million metric tons. In 2021, the companies received about $8 billion, then a record number due to higher prices. In 2022, they took in over 18 billion because of even higher prices. On top of the windfall they received in 2021, the 2022 windfall added another $7.4 billion windfall profits. The government took about 1.4 billion and the companies got the other five. A commercial break. <laughs> uh, the government took 1.4 billion and the companies got the other 5.8 billion. The company's new $5.8 billion windfall just for 2022 was higher than the entire gross profits of the potash companies in any year before that. The potash companies are the most profitable businesses operating in the province. They are almost exclusively owned by shareholders outside the province. We are told by some politicians, quote, they don't pick winners and losers, end quote. The marginal effect of tax rates in different industries in Saskatchewan would suggest otherwise. 
For oil and gas companies, the rate is 37.1%. Communications, 35.5%. Construction, 31.1%. Other services, 31.1%. Wholesale trade, 28.7%. Retail trade, 28%. Potash companies, between negative 0.4 and 21.9%. So if you run a trucking business or a hotel or a construction business or a store, you pay a much higher marginal effective tax rate than a potash company. Individuals at the higher end of their income would pay a much higher rate than the potash companies. Most people understand that when their income goes up, the rate of tax they pay at the upper end is higher. Yet in 2021, when the companies took in $8 billion, their tax rate as a percentage of sales was about 19%. In 2022, when they got $18 billion, that rate went down to about 16%. Before the windfall profits started in 2008, government took around 13.5% of revenue in the prior 10 years. Since the windfall profits started, the rate of tax paid by the potash companies as a percentage of their sales is lower than before the windfall profits. Well, I thought that didn't sound like a very good situation. Then the latest provincial budget documents were released last week. <laughs> they estimate potash revenue for the 22-23 fiscal year just ending to be $730 million, down from $1.3 billion estimated by the government in last year's budget. That amounts to about 8% of the 200, 2023 sales of $9.1 billion. The $730 million paid to government for 2003 is about the same amount paid in 2015 when sales were $6 billion, or in 2018, when the sales were $5.7 billion, or in 2019, when the sales were $6.3 billion. So revenue goes way up, tax rates go down, and in that particular case, actually stayed the same. I'm sure all of us have experienced that in our tax files <laughs> well. I want to quote from page 78 of my book where it is stated in uh, reference to studies authored by Jack Mintz and his colleagues, Yuan Ji Chen, quote, in 2013, Chen and Mintz authored a paper that states Saskatchewan's royalty and tax system for potash, quote, has actually reached the point of incoherence and absurdity, or a mess, end quote. In a 2015 paper, the same authors speculated that the province's abundance of a natural resource as valuable as potash may have, quote, engendered an approach whereby tax policy has not been considered a top priority. Well, maybe it is time that the matter be considered a top priority. When potash companies pay less taxes, others must pay more, or cutbacks to government programs may occur. Ordinary people and businesses pay more, and that's why they have seen their consumption taxes to the province doubled in the last 15 years. While potash companies have been receiving huge windfall profits for 15 years, the government has been unable to balance the budget even in good economic times. If you were looking for ways to obtain more revenue, where would you look? One would have thought it might be an option to look at the wealthiest among us to contribute to the public good especially if much of their wealth came from buying public resources at highly discounted prices. Instead, other solutions were favored. We've gone from number one in the country 
in terms of pure pupil education funding to number eight. Sales taxes on everyone, as I just mentioned, including working people and small businesses, have doubled. Parents may have to pay $200 a year so their kids can eat lunch at school. The government stopped paying for school supplies for kids on welfare and stopped paying rent to landlords and utilities on behalf of people on social assistance. This has resulted in record numbers of people evicted and on the streets and the need for large homeless shelters. Those things are directly connected. Lack of staff and equipment required to perform essential tests in the healthcare system has resulted in unacceptable wait times and increased suffering. We're sending people out of the province for medical treatment at greater expense. The debt has doubled in the last 15 years. Interest charges on that debt are about $800 million a year. And I could go on and on. Meanwhile, Saskatchewan is worst or second worst in the country in the areas of child poverty, family poverty, incarceration, youth incarceration, and educational outcomes. This situation is referred to as growth that works for everyone. <laughs> but do we really have confidence that we are taking appropriate steps to prepare the next generation for successful lives? Is this what we want Saskatchewan to look like? I'm not going to read too much from the book, but I will read two more excerpts. First, uh, from a chapter called Corporate Windfall, Saskatchewan Shortfall at page 124. Miguel Sanchez, the author of the Campaign 2000 Report on Child Poverty in Saskatchewan, has stated that despite raising the issue of child poverty year after year, he saw, quote, the continuity of the same socio-political economic model that seems to privilege private interest over public interest and over people, end quote. It is difficult to disagree that private interests are in a privileged position over the public interest. Shareholders who live outside the province receive favorable treatment, while the vulnerable within the province receive less as time goes on. It is inexplicable that the companies and shareholders in a situation of huge profit would be favored over Saskatchewan people. Now, uh, before I go on, I just want to say, so I don't forget, um, not everybody agrees necessarily with partial public ownership of Potash industry, but I think it brought the Potash Corporation together to begin with. And I just want to say, Elwood Cowley is here, and I, there's a lot of distinguished people here, but I want to single out Al, Elwood because he really was the architect 50 years ago of the legislation to create the Potash Corporation of Saskatchewan. So take away Elwood. Thank you for that. Um, now, I'm not saying what I'm going to say next to blow my own horn, but to answer those who think they understand business and the economy and say that all of this is required to provide a good investment climate. I think I can say without fear of contradiction, that as a minister of the Crown, I did more to provide incentives to business and working individuals and reward investment than any minister in the current government. I was minister of finance for five years and minister of industry and resources for five years. And I have worked in the private sector more than ministers in the current government. With my colleagues, we abolished the former income tax system and replaced it with a new system, reducing personal income taxes by over 30%. We revised oil and gas taxes and created a level playing field for oil with Alberta, surpassing Alberta in conventional oil production. 
We provided incentives to potash companies in 2003 at a time when they were not receiving windfall profits to encourage them to refurbish existing mines and to expand mines, which they did. We reduced corporate capital taxes. We reduced the sales tax to 5% and it only applied to about half of the things it applies to now. My record speaks for itself. There is no one who is more in favor of a reasonable rate of return for investors than I am. But I must underscore the word reasonable. It does not include giving our resources away. What do windfall profits not arising from investment have to do with return on investment? Nothing. Some say increasing taxes on potash companies would be a job killer. Well, there's a difference between the interests of shareholders and the interests of workers. Shareholders could get less. Workers and people in Saskatchewan should get more. No one wants to put people out of work. To suggest that is simply your laundry. True, the potash companies spend about $800 million per year in wages for Saskatchewan workers. I would hope so. When they are taking multiple billions of dollars each year, most of which is shipped directly out of the province. Higher wages for potash workers and more jobs would result in net benefit to Saskatchewan because the workers would spend practically all of their money here, unlike out of province shareholders. Let's be considerate of the interests of investors and shareholders. At the same time, let's be considerate of the needs of children to be fed and have a quality education, of patients to be treated, and of people to have a roof over their heads. Let's be considerate of the need of working people and industries to have a tax system where everyone pays their share. Let's reduce the debt servicing costs we pay to investment bankers and use it for the benefit of Saskatchewan citizens. I hope this book will cause people to think about what kind of society we want to be in Saskatchewan. We are very privileged to be blessed with resources which allow us, unlike just about anywhere else in the world, to build a society of greater equality of opportunity, a more healthy, safe, and secure society. If we do not act to leverage our unique potash resource, we are not taking the opportunity to maximize benefit to Saskatchewan people, and we are indeed simply continuing to squander our potash legacy. Before giving people an opportunity to ask questions, I'd like to close by reading a few more paragraphs uh, from the book. It's 132, 134, not the whole pages. Uh, many people believe the government doesn't know how to run a business, that DCS was a failed and costly venture as a crown corporation and that its creation frightened investment away from Saskatchewan. They believe it was sold to private parties who are able to diversify and grow the company, thereby generating economic activity that circulates throughout Saskatchewan. This narrative has been promoted by the defenders of the private model. Looking at the facts objectively, including the financial performance of PCS's Crown Corporation, the potash industry's recovery in the 1990s, the fact that no potash owner other than the Saskatchewan government sold their mines off in 1989 at the bottom of the mountain pit. And finally, the industry's financial returns, it is difficult to accept that narrative. An alternative narrative is as follows. PCS's privatization caused a loss of tens of billions of dollars to Saskatchewan. The province sold infrastructure and assets when no one else did, in an industry that cannot go anywhere and in which it is not difficult to make a lot of money. After preventing BHP from making an offer to PCS shareholders, the Saskatchewan government stood idly by 
as PCS was integrated into a multinational fertilizer conglomerate that aims to have an economical source of potash for its fertilizer retail operations. Having opted for full public ownership, the province still could have obtained maximum value from the sale of its potash, but has chosen not to do so. For 15 years, voices on the right and left of the political spectrum, as well as people in the center, have offered expert analysis to the government, identifying a serious problem and offering a solution. The Saskatchewan government, rather than following the advice of independent experts, has instead relied upon the advice of experts from the industry itself. When confronted by poverty, a crisis in healthcare, an education system crying out for more resources to prepare Saskatchewan children for a successful life, and a high rate of poverty, incarceration, and homelessness. The wealthiest corporations operating in the province are undertaxed, while the government cuts back on the poorest of the poor. The province can set aside the notion that what is good for big business is good for Saskatchewan and bargain hard on behalf of the people of the province. It is apparent that has not been occurring for some time. Saskatchewan's birthright is a resource so sufficiently vast, rich, and in demand that it could enable the province to build a model society. The province can have quality education, health care, and programming for the benefit of all its citizens. It can end poverty and homelessness. It can leave more earnings in the pockets of working people and the coffers of industries other than potash. It can do these things if it decides to. Thank you very much. And so now uh, I will take questions. I'll try to just recognize people as their hands go up, starting by these three. Hi, Eric. Thanks so much for your uh, presentation. I look forward to reading the book. Um, obviously, there was a, um, a part of the presentation you're talking about windfall profits. So I wanted you to elaborate a bit more on that because obviously, what you're talking about, I imagine the threshold be between regular profit, I like use that term. And, win and windfall profits is important for your whole argument you're trying to make in the book. So where does a regular profit turn into a windfall profit? Okay, well, it's a very good question. Um, there, I don't have an exact number for what a reasonable rate of return on investment would be, although I think there are people that would be qualified to say, say that. But uh, to put it in context, I would explain it this way. Uh, in 2007, when the world price of oil was 270, I think, dollars a share, or a metric ton, uh, the report, the annual report of the Potash Corporation of Saskatchewan said, we are thriving. You know, that was a higher price than they had had in the past. So we know that they were making a reasonable rate of return at $270. Uh, then that over the next 12 months, the, the price shot up to um, uh, eight, uh, $740. So it almost tripled. And so you know that since they're already making a reasonable rate of return, everything else is gravy. You know, and really that additional uh, money that just came from a higher world demand and a higher price, which had nothing to do with investment risk taken by the industry, that's a windfall. And... Uh, what we've seen since then is just uh, windfall after windfall. And what I do in the book is I take the base of $270 and put it in real dollar terms up until the present date. And what the companies would be getting at that rate, since they were doing quite well at that rate, what they actually got and what the difference is. And I think, you know, it, it then indicates that the potential windfall profits that they've earned could be up to something like $20 billion over period of time. And, uh, you know, you just look at, you consider the difference between 2021 and 2022. You know, in 2021, 
they're getting $8 billion revenue. And, and there's all kinds of windfall in that, but leave that aside for a moment. 2022 comes along, just because of a higher price, they get 18 billion, 10 billion just dumped on them. If it hadn't been, they'd, they'd still be making money hand over fist and I'd still be staying here or making windfall profits. But they got like 7.2 of that billion of that was just windfall profits from higher prices. And that should go to the public. You know, and at worst, it should be uh, a 20 80 split between, like, with 20% to the companies, maybe, and 80% to the government, but not the other way around. When you're, you're running a deficit, imagine running a deficit in those circumstances instead of tapping the money from those companies. Then all of that money, they can talk about their $800 million payroll every year. All of that money, those billions of dollars, are going to shareholders elsewhere. And you know, and the, the folly of the privatization was that it, the theory is you privatize, the money goes into the economy and it circulates around and does something. Well, yes, it does in New York, in Toronto, or wherever the money goes to, but not in Saskatchewan. You know, anyway, I've gone beyond your question. But windfall, uh, windfall profits to me are profits that don't relate to any reasonable return on an investment. Uh, somebody's t uh, made and risk they've taken. It's just uh, being lucky enough to live in a time when prices go way up and there's money to be had. And Blakeney and Lougheed had the right approach in the 1974. That was all windfall because the price just doubled and the companies already made their investments. So uh, that's the nature of it. And, you know, uh, when... The companies come out to prevent a review from happening. You know, they don't want any discussion of this. And the government doesn't want any discussion of this. You know, they say it kills jobs. Well, this is exactly the kind of discussion the public should be having. And uh, the reason they don't want any review or discussion is because they know any review would find that they were shortchanging the people of the province. And from the government's point of view, they can't admit that any of this is legitimate because they'd be revealing themselves of having not served the interests of the people of the province. Anyway, I've talked too long, so next question. Yeah, I'll take the lady back and then you. Hi, Eric, it's Judy Dick. I don't know if you remember me. I do, Judy. Yeah. How could I forget? I know, because you promised you were going to wash dishes at my place and you forgot to bring a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Did I wash the dishes? No, you didn't. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> the background with, when uh, Eric was, uh, I believe at the time of Shargol, and I was the honorary consul for the Netherlands, and I had the ambassador to the Netherlands over and uh, wanted to have a barbecue and have people representing agriculture and mining and uh, oil and gas and so i phoned eric uh, i knew him a little bit from uh, his government days and uh, he graciously came over and some people had brought wine was not a requirement and my daughter was uh, getting the guests in while i was in the backyard and uh eric says oh was i supposed to bring a bottle of wine and my daughter said yes she said there's a liquor board store about three blocks away <laughs> well, your other option is to wash dishes though <laughs> But, but I didn't do it. Didn't go see it. But, but I didn't eat, did I? Oh, I didn't. <laughs> it's not, it's not sound, I recall that. Anyway, I digress. So I didn't get to finish your book, Eric, but um, uh, I look at what's happening in, uh, I've got lots of questions, but anyways, I'm going to leave it down to this. Mary Magic talked about how the federal government was going after the profits of the uh, the law of laws, you know, the Westons and the uh, and the other uh, grocery industries. Um, and nobody ever looks at the profits by the potash uh, CEOs and uh, senior management. Um, so there seems to be a lot of investigation into looking at how the profits are for the uh, grocery industry. Why, I mean, if the provincial government's not going to do it, how do we how do we look at uh, evaluating not only just the potash, but all the other uh, resources that we have, you know, uranium, gold, etc., to ensure that we're getting the, uh, the benefits from uh, those investments. Um, you know, because whether you argue whether private or public uh, investments, it has to be what's best for the province. And, and I don't, I don't want to detract investment from the province, but at the same time, 
I want to see a more balanced uh, what you're talking about. So anyway, thanks for writing the book and for, you know, um, sometimes we need to have that information put into a <clears throat> condensed book so that we can see that average person has a better understanding of what's going on in the discussion with government. Well, thank you, Judy. Those are all good questions. And uh, I think uh, part of it for me is public awareness. It's getting the word out there about what is really happening and for the public to be informed and to say to the people in government that they expect that the public will get a fair return. And as you said, it has to be a balance. It has to be a balance between uh, the uh, interest of the uh, potash producer to make a reasonable rate of return and the interest of the public in getting a fair price for their potash. And all we hear is talk about uh, the investment climate. And I think you can have a pretty good investment climate if you're giving things away, you know. But uh, I, I don't think, I think industry understands that we do not want to be taken advantage of and that we want a reasonable share from our resources. I think if they were honest, they would have to admit that we're not getting that. And I don't think they can, with the straight face, defend the system that we have now for all the reasons um, I've stated. But uh, I do think that people, regardless of their political persuasion, will all agree in Saskatchewan that we should get a fair return on our resources through taxation. Not everybody will, as I believe, in partial public ownership of the potash industry. But whether people believe that or not, they will agree that we need a fair return. And um, if that has to be looked at through some kind of uh, public inquiry or public review that is transparent and objective and honest, I think that would be a good thing. But people have to speak up to government and the opposition for that matter. They have to demand that this issue be dealt with and that they not continue to sweep it under the carpet, as they clearly both are. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry I didn't wash the dishes, <laughs> but thank you for the supper. It was very really good. Okay, <laughs> next question. Oh, sorry, Mike. Yeah, I, I guess really pretty well asked my question, but as far as the mechanics of that go, as far as us and from the government. How do you perceive that happening? Is that better ready MLAs? Is that is, how do we get the ball rolling? Obviously, the government is embarrassed because if they brought this up now, they'd be like, stop it. How do you actually make that happen? Do you well, the question? Okay, the question here? is how do you? make it known to the government and politicians that were not satisfied with the status quo in terms of their taxation. And, uh, you know, I just think it's, uh, it's just stating it to them, frankly, like that this isn't good enough and don't give me a bunch of phony baloney excuses about it. It's just not acceptable. Like eight percent of the revenue this year isn't acceptable. What are you going to do about it? And uh, I think that they are listening to the potash companies all the time, meeting with them all the time, and uh, you know, uh, listening to their stories about how they need a return on investment. They're not hearing as much as they should from the public because the public doesn't really know what is going on. It has not been publicized. Now, one of the advantages of my book, I think, is that, you know, these companies make profits in a variety of areas. You know, they have phosphate operations, they have nitrogen operations, they have retail operations. I, I don't have those in the numbers. I just take out what they make from Saskatchewan potash, disaggregate that in the case of each company, and then combine them together so that we can see what it is. So it becomes less confusing and more clear. And when we look at what the money is being made from potash and what, what we're getting, it's just clear. And in my opinion, it's indefensible. And we just have to start saying that to politicians. It's just not acceptable. So writing our MLA? Oh, we're writing or talking to them or, uh, yeah, I, I mean, just whatever, like, but not being afraid to say it and uh, and just not taking no 
for an answer. You know, there, this has to be dealt with, in my opinion, because this is the most important question that faces the province. We have people living in dire poverty here. And it's growing. We can see it on the streets. We see the, the poverty. We see the people in the streets. We see the homeless. And uh, the, the answer to how we deal with the potash tax question will determine what kind of society we're going to have. And right now, I don't think it's going in the right direction. I think it's going to a greater divide between people with wealth who are comfortable and a lot of people who are desperately poor. That's what I see, and we need to change it. And, and I think this is how we change it. I think there was somebody over here. Oh, somebody at the back there. Yes, uh, Grant Orchard. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Klein. Very interesting. I'm looking forward to your book. I wonder if since the release and the news of your book, uh, if there's been any indication of any interest from any in the current government uh, circles of uh, curiosity or acceptiveness or even in the opposition? No, I have not received any overtures from anyone in government or the opposition uh, to discuss it. I see... Uh, I don't know if it's more advertising by the potash companies at the airport and other places about uh, the wonderful things that they're doing. And I mean, they do do wonderful things in terms of employment and sponsorship and so on. But those things are not a substitute to a fair taxation system. And one of the things we do, I think, in North America, unlike Europe, is that instead of having higher taxes and having the government determine what kind of equipment you have in hospitals and so on. We rely to a larger extent on uh, private philanthropy and charity. And uh, corporate sponsorship in one sense is uh, something that almost lulls us into accepting tax regimes that, um, that really aren't that acceptable. Um, so, but I, I you know, I, I'm sure Aaron Weir and Jack Mintz uh, would agree with the statement that uh, I'm sure it's much more difficult for us to get the ear of people in elected office than it is for the potash companies themselves, who I think can get a meeting with legislatures anytime they want. And that's not the case with uh, us. Yes. I went to my uh, granddaughter's grade six classroom to deliver her trumpet that she forgot to take on the bus in the College Park area in Saskatoon. I knocked on the door. This class was about to start. The door opened. The teacher is here, and I believe the intern over there. And I said to myself, oh, my God, you could not stop another child in that classroom. Went down and talked to the secretary about it. I said, whatever happened to you? That's the trailers, I guess they were called portables. That's how we used to do with the, the flow and the flux of the computer. And then the light bulb went on and I said to her, oh, if they had a, a portable, they're gonna have to hire another teacher. And she said, yes. So if the, if the opposition could tie your book and what you're telling us, and I've said this for years, I never understood why potash was sold off because looking at the, uh, my brother worked in oil industries in Middle East, and he just goes like, what are we doing here? As you said, they kept interest in their resources, and that's how they became wealthy. So maybe the opposition can start tying this message together, especially with education, because that's a, you know, that's gone way too far. Well, I think you're right, and I think it's the elephant in the room. I think it is what has to be brought into the discussion. We can talk about a crisis in education, but uh, you don't hear anybody in the Legislative Assembly saying, well, maybe it's because we don't charge enough to the resource companies. Maybe we could get more. Nobody ever says, uh, why are we increasing consumption taxes on small businesses and ordinary people instead of getting a bit more money from the potash companies? They just don't say it. 
Uh, I think they're afraid to say it because they'll be accused of wanting to put a tax on wealth or raise taxes. And I think that there's a difference between threatening to raise taxes on everyone and imposing higher taxes on entities that are making really obscene profits in the province. And that should not be a difficult message for competent politicians to deliver. But uh, it seems that nobody up to this point wants to deliver it. So that's something also that should be mentioned to politicians in the province, that they should speak up about that. You know, and when it comes to education and the underfunding of education, someone once said, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. <laughs> Because we are going to pay a big price for the bad social policies that are going on right now in the province. And when the government stopped paying the rent to the landlords and paying utilities, it resulted in hundreds, if not thousands of people being evicted from their homes. They don't have public housing to go to. There's 3,600 public housing units that are not repaired. You see people in the streets like you've never seen before. And it's it's a disgusting and, and saddening sight I mean, to go through Saskatoon and see that. And it doesn't have to be that way. And instead of the government sort of wondering why we need large homeless shelters, they need to start making some of the changes that are necessary to prevent it. I mean, I'm going on too long, but you're right. These things are connected. And that's why I want to make the point that something has to change here. Yes. Why do you think, it just seems to me while watching the uh, current government, when we went to the BHP and uh, Agrium or Nutrium and their support uh, for PTS at the time, uh, why, why do you feel that um, there is such a I don't know, the holding to the to the potash industry when in fact the resources belong to the province and the and the government's responsible for managing those resources. And so so what what is what is the uh, uh why are they so intimidated, I guess, by the potash department? I think that the people in government believe that if big business tells them they're doing a good job, that they're doing a good job. I personally believe that if big, big business tells you you're doing a good job, you're probably not doing a good job because it's the job of big business to push the envelope forward, to ask for lower taxes, less regulation, and so on. And it's the job of the government to have the public interest in mind and push back. Well, no, we can't give you that. And... Uh, so when uh, we, when the party I was with was in power, you know, you constantly have this tension in, in the media that, you know, the potash companies want this, but the government says that, and it looks like you're having a fight about it. And to me, that's the way it should be. When you have the potash company saying, everything is just perfect the way it is, I don't think the government's being doing very much pushing back. And it's very curious because, uh, you know, PCS wanted the government of Saskatchewan to get the government of Canada to disallow the BHP bid to take over PCS. And they got the government of Canada to do that because that's what PCS wanted. And then when PCS wanted to go into Agrium to form a nutrient, which is our potash company, largest potash producer in the world, going into a fertilizer company so that they can have a cheap source of fertilizer for American farmers. But what did the government of Saskatchewan say? Nothing. It was okay because that's what PCS wanted. And uh, it's it's a serious problem when government is only listening to big business. And I think that's what the, that is what they are doing. And I think they believe that big business knows what it's doing. And if you listen to them, you're going to do okay. And uh, to me, it's just a very naive view, but but I think clearly that's what's been going on.
think I'm getting a signal that I should stop. You have five minutes left. Five minutes left. Okay. Myron. Is it time for you to come out of retirement, come back and start running for politics again? <laughs> Sorry, <Ellie. laughs> uh, Apparently not. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Any serious question? <laughs> I started reading what you say. I was told once the successful negotiation, neither party is over. Uh, and I think that goes to the point of the Polish companies always being really happy. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Well, Vic and then the lady back. Book authors get uh, interviewed a lot. Radio talk shows, for example, uh, all the time. And then, of course, it's up to the radio talk show host as to who they want to interview. But it might be worth try. I mean, CBC has talk shows, news talk shows, and uh, Rolko has a uh, talk show in uh, both uh, Saskatoon and Regina. And it would be interesting to see if uh, you try to get on there. If you, you, might, you might have to supply a compliment and probably a good luck to, uh, to John Gormley's uh, replacement. No, actually, I, but I have been on there. I've been on CBC twice and I. Okay. I was on the global TV and I'm going on the. About this? Yeah. I'm going okay. on the Evan Bray show on Monday. Good. Yeah. Well, that's a way to get it out to the grassroots, to people yeah. in their homes and cars and offices and uh, tell it like it is. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. I was just wondering if you had any sense that if there was a change in government that you would have a politicians that, that would sort of take on the government? Well, I, I can't speak. Yeah, well, the question is, uh, do I have a sense that if there was a change in government, do I think there would be a change in approach? I think there would be. Uh, I think that the uh, opposition is being very cautious because oppositions believe that governments are not elected but defeated, so they're, you know, really just being quiet and waiting for the SAS party to make uh, some gap. Uh, and that's a strategy. Uh, I I think that they could probably afford to be quite aggressive on this issue and that they would get a lot of public support. Uh, whether or not that is their view, I don't know. I don't know what their view is and it hasn't been indicated to me. But uh, I would like to think that if the government changed, that uh, we would see some change in policy. Okay. Oh, one more at the back, and then we'll go to the signing, I guess. Yeah, I was just wondering, say we did have these windfalls, right, and they were going to the government, that would greater expose us to these huge fluctuations in revenue. What do you think needs to be done to better manage those revenues, I think? As finance minister, you had ran a stabilization fund, which you could put in and then draw out from with uh, resource revenues. So do you think we need that kind of approach? Or do we need some longer term sovereign wealth fund type of approach? I think there are two things at least that you could do. One is to do what you suggested and have uh, some money go in, in really good years to go into a stabilization fund. And also uh, Jack Mintz has proposed as part of the system he would advocate um, that you have a minimum tax on the companies whereby if the their revenue goes way down, they still pay a certain amount of tax. And then in more profitable years, um, uh, that, that, that comes back to them in the form of lower taxes than they would normally be in that year. I don't think it's that difficult to actually build that into a system to, you know, deal with the, the volatility at all. And um, it, it could be done, certainly. And it just takes some discipline. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, well, I think I'm supposed to stop there and sit down and so that people want to buy books and have me sign them, I'll do that. And once again, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. And I hope if you agree,
Uh, to, in the message to the book, you'll tell all your friends about it too and get them thinking and neighbors and relatives. And uh, my wife says, tell them to buy a book. <laughs> but, uh, she doesn't know there's no money in writing. But thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. There are copies of the book at the desk to your right, if you want one, and you're welcome to get it signed first uh, before you go to the cash desk. Thank you all, and have a good evening.